Go ahead, Charlie. Okay, welcome everyone to meeting number 3,766 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. We have two basic rules at the college, one of which is one fool at a time, meaning don't interrupt the speaker, and the second one are no personal attacks. No personal attacks. Now, our basic format is a speaker's presentation followed by questions and answers. The third part is audience remarks on the topic, a few minutes. And the final part will be the speaker's final comments. So, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On May 18th, we're going to have two experts on nuclear reactors. And transporting nuclear waste will be the primary topic. David Kraft of NEIS and um, Kevin, Kevin of the Radioactive Waste Watchdog Group. So nuclear, uh, nuclear energy is going to be the topic. Um, on May the 25th, uh, two of our college regulars will be revealing a plot by the Trump people to steal the, 20, the 2024 election. They've got a plan and have set it in motion if they do not win the election, the presidential election. Mm. Uh, let's see, that's on the 25th. Hang on, Charlie. At June the 1st, please, uh, at June the 1st, um, we have a young man, Tom O'Donnell, uh, will be talking, asking, trying to seek answers to the question, uh, why is life not financially fair? Why is there social stratification of wealth in the United States? I can tell you why, but we'll let this, the college give an answer. On June the 8th, um, we're, we're going to switch to an ecological topic. It's going to be the migratory birds. Mm -hmm. to, to alleviate the, the obstructions to migratory bird populations in the Chicago metropolitan area. On the 15th, we have our own Sid Cohen is there tonight, I believe. Yeah. We'll be talking about Marxism and dialectic materialism. Communism, uh, the basis of communism is a dialectic material method. So that's on the 15th. On the 22nd, I see he's there tonight, Kim Sipes. We'll be talking about how capitalism is the primary cause of climate change and what we can do to alleviate it. You can read the write-up in further detail there on his presentation. On uh, the 29th, um, let's see, we got the plot. What, what is which plot is that? Um, I can't remember. We're trying to, Charlie, I'm trying to get the zoom up and it's not working for a minute, so just give me a second, please. Okay. Okay. I Okay, uh, I want to get May up here, and it's just the browser's not working properly. And sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, now you're up. Sorry about that. Where Why don't you review? We're already in June. There's tonight. Move up. Okay, June it is. Nuclear. May twenty okay. fifth. The plot. All right. Now June first. June eighth, they're the birds. Continue scrolling. And there's Sid Cohen's speech. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, you go ahead. Move up. I've already done the twenty second. That's a climate crisis. Okay. Um. Uh, and then I, I know you already uh, talked about 29th, and then we'll go to the following month. Okay, go ahead, July 6th. The following month is 
We're going to do something a little different for Independence Day. We're going to do a point counterpoint program. Two college regulars, myself, we're taking on Peter Piro. And I'm going to present. I'm good. Please keep it down in the audience, please. Thank you. I'm going to be presenting 25 mistakes our country has made and what we can do to correct these. And Peter's going to say he thinks that the United States has made 25 wonderful accomplishments. So to play a point counterpoint, you can come up with ones on your own and take at the podium. And on the 13th of July, we're going to have an expert on chemtrails and geoengineering, controlling the weather. Uh, what is the government up to regarding these chemtrails in the sky? So that he's a filmmaker as well. Uh, so that's June. Now that is two open dates at the tail end of July, the 20th and 27th. If you'd like to speak, I must have a title and a written description of the program. Okay, take it away, Tim. It's all yours. All right. Uh, now I'm going to introduce D Knight. D, the uh, for the uh, platform is yours. If you can want to share a screen, you should be able to do so. Uh, let's give it up for D Knight. Yeah. Oh, Thank you very much. Thank right. you very much. Hi, hi, hi. All right. Again, we're going to we're going to go on mute in the restaurant while you're presenting D, so that you can uh, see everything. So go ahead and start going. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, first, I want to thank the College of Complexes for inviting me. Um, now, for the second the second time, I had a wonderful time with you two years ago, um, in, uh, introducing my memoir, which is still out. It has a new edition. Uh, I have a new publisher, Solidarity Publications, and the book is even better, if you can imagine. Um, this time... I'm presenting a realistic path for peace. And it's uh, uh, all caps, an important book. Um, it's just released last month in a new edition that draws the connections between official US support for genocide against Palestinians. Um, let me see if I can pull up the um, website just so you can see where it is. Uh, it can actually, you okay. can you can go on, go out there and uh, there you see the book. It's got quite a number of great endorsers. It's got the story, my story, um, has frequently asked questions, a press release about the book. Um, we also have some podcasts. There's actually a listing of the podcast I did with Chicago's College of Complexes two years ago. Um, and if you decide you'd like to get a preview of the book, you can uh, actually see videos of uh, that me reading uh, the introduction, the preface, and the concluding chapters. Um, these cartoons give a sense of what it's really about. I'm going to go ahead and talk with you about, about what it's really about. It draws connections between the official U.S. support for genocide against Palestinians and its ongoing effort to extend NATO to the border with Russia and escalate threats against China. This new edition comes in the midst of a surge of solidarity with Palestine as students at hundreds of U.S. college campuses and many more in other countries have already finally forced the war planners in Washington to pause shipments of bombs to their Israeli partners. This pause is a tacit and reluctant admission that responsibility for the genocide resides in Washington and that the determined massive protests to stop it have nothing absolutely nothing in common with what they shamelessly call anti-Semitism. Now I'll read a few paragraphs from the book's preface and conclusion to give you a sense of what's in store. Bear in mind that, as you can see here, it's possible 
that you could go to that website and hear more. Uh, and there's lots more there. So allow me to go ahead and read. The world is in a crisis now. As its empire declines towards collapse, the United States leadership is making a series of disastrous errors. The neocons in Washington, D.C. are determined to maintain U.S. global domination regardless of what it might take. The stakes are high for them. They seem to believe that if they allow any other country to challenge their global leadership, their whole system could fall apart. They consider it crucial to control global trade, especially the trade in energy. So they're prepared to do whatever it takes, supporting genocide in Israel by providing weapons, money, and a bizarre moral justification for horrific genocidal bombing is a sign of what it takes. <clears throat> Blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline was another sign of what it can take. That was a desperate last dish measure after efforts to persuade their strongest European ally to cut off Russian energy supplies didn't work. Europeans are now paying much higher prices for natural gas and oil than they did before. The result has been a drastic change in living standards for ordinary people in Europe and major economic problems across the entire world. Western European leaders have rounded up and bludgeoned into a unified NATO alliance uh, against Russia and in support of Israeli genocide against Palestinians. This alliance, originally composed of North Atlantic countries under US leadership at the end of World War II, is also now being extended to Asia, not exactly close to the North Atlantic. It's a quest to curb China's historic economic success, which threatens Western domination of global trade. And from the concluding chapter, as the International Court of Justice ponders the case for genocide against Israel, its onslaught against the Palestinians threatens to mushroom into a global war. Israel is unlikely to convince the court that it had, has been a victim of terrorism after 75 years continuously terrorizing the original inhabitants of the Holy Land, and after... Sorry about that. We okay? Yeah, I just... Uh, you're right, floating down in volume, so I just took the microphone and put it next to the computer speakers. Go ahead. Okay. I'll just pick up on the conclusion again. I was saying, as the International Court of Justice ponders the case for genocide against Israel... Go ahead. It's on slot against the Palestinians threatens to mushroom into a global war. Israel is unlikely to convince the court that it has been a victim of terrorism after 75 years continuously terrorizing the original inhabitants of the Holy Land and after grass mowing attacks on Gaza almost every other year since 2008. Unsuccessful in eradicating the Palestinian resistance in Gaza, in spite of the awful toll of its bombing campaign, Israel has already resorted to provocative, targeted assassinations in Lebanon, Syria, and Iran. Netanyahu, whose political fortunes seem to depend on many more months of war, as he says, seems to hope to drag the U.S. into a regional war. Will the U.S. take the bait? Endless war was the nightmare promise of Donald Rumsfeld and George Bush back in 2001, following the attacks on the World Trade Center that year. The world has lived through nightmare ever since. In Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, the former Yugoslavia, Yemen, Somalia, Ukraine, and at home. The nightmare threatens to morph into global catastrophe as Israel's U.S.-backed genocidal slaughter against Gaza hits the brink of regional war in West Asia. It could easily become global, involving both Russia and China. Such a war, even if it did not blow up the world, would destroy the global economy uh, the U.S. and its allies want to dominate. The stakes are high. What if the U.S. war machine can be stopped and the U.S. disarmed? 
it may seem like a distant hope now, but the progression of current events could change that. The neocons in Washington are gambling big time with their proxy war against Russia, support for Israeli genocide in Gaza, and their escalating threats against China. What if they lose? The Palestinians refuse to retreat and are frustrating Israel's efforts to crush their resistance. Russia is determined not to lose because if it were to lose, it would be broken up like Yugoslavia and the USSR. And defeating China is not likely to be any easier for the US than its adventures in Korea and Vietnam, probably much harder. The day of reckoning is likely to come sooner than expected as a result of the extremely bad gamble the U.S. neocons are taking against Russia, China, and the people of Palestine. For many, for many of us, that day cannot come soon enough. As U.S. hegemony wanes, new possibilities will emerge across the globe and here at home. The maniacs in Washington may try to do what they've done before, using extreme measures to hold back change. That, but popular forces in this country and around the world can and must intervene to protect our interests and make change happen. A new multipolar world is dawning that will replace the old imperialist order with peace and common prosperity for a shared future. It's a dest it is the destiny of today's generation to hasten its arrival. That's it from the introduction and the conclusion. There's more. It's a big book um, divided into six sessions, uh, but I've tried to make it easy and acceptable, accessible. There's also a digital book and an audio book due out by the end of the month. That's it. Let me have your questions and comments. Uh, all right, so you want to go to questions now then? Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, Jake, it's uh, you're muted, but go ahead. Jake, if you've got your hand up, go ahead, Jake. Hi, tell, tell us the name of the book and your name again. My name is D. Knight, and the name of the book, if you can see on the screen, is A Realistic Path to Peace from... Okay. Okay. Genocide to global war and how hey, we can, can you stop, stop your screen sharing so we can uh, make sure we can see everybody if you don't mind. You want me to stop the screen share? Yeah, because now we're in a questions and answers and it's going to be. Sure. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. how, or how, okay. How can you justify saying that the situation in Gaza is our fault when this has been brewing for decades? All those decades, yeah. all those decades, uh, have counted on uh, continuous, lavish U.S. sponsorship of Israel. Uh, there's a, it, it's, in my view, reasonable to say that Israel uh, is uh, virtually a creation of the United States. What, what that is I, not. That is not so. That's that's historically inaccurate. And I don't want to go into it, but it's historically inaccurate. Well, we Sam, did. We, we. It's historically inaccurate, and um, the the uh, the other the other side to it is, if I, I heard this from an Israeli peace activist years ago, that if 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 if, if we didn't if we didn't support Israel financially, they and they wanted to continue doing what they're doing, they would continue doing what they're doing and just figure out another way of paying for it. That's entirely possible. I certainly don't argue with that, although um, it's worth remembering that uh, Joe Biden in the Senate uh, about 30 years ago um, defending Israel said, if Israel didn't exist, we would have to invent it. Uh, it is uh, uh, like a stable aircraft carrier for the United States uh, in the oil rich and strategic Middle East. Yeah, except there is no oil in Israel. What I said was what Joe Biden said, that uh, is for him, Israel is like a stable aircraft carrier uh, uh, guarding oh, oh. the strategic interests of the United States 
including okay. the all right. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, there's nobody here. Charlie, go ahead. You're next. Yes, uh, D. The Muslims in the Middle East have historically expressed hostility towards the United States. And I find it a little difficult to place them as good guys when they've expressed and taken actions against the West. Now, I realize they may have reasons for doing so, but I don't know if this places them necessarily in the category of uh, innocent uh, good guys. What are well, your feelings in that regard? Thank you. It's a good question. Uh, it's a little bit like the uh, Native Americans, the indigenous people of this country. Um, uh, the, uh, the Palestinians specifically are the indigenous people of uh, the land currently occupied by Israel. And um, they believe that their land has been stolen and uh, their fight is to get it back. And uh, that uh, land theft is uh, essentially financed and uh, protected militarily by the United States with its support for Israel. And, you know, the, the Israeli occupation of uh, Palestine is historically very similar to the uh, uh, gigantic and massive takeover by the United States of all of North America, but specifically looking at it uh, uh, during the last century and a half. It, that's, of, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very poor analogy. It has nothing to do with that. Uh, Jerry, let's, uh, Jerry, okay. let's, let's, let's uh, yeah. not interrupt the speakers, please. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I, know, I would like to well, add one more thing about it. Uh, I cut my teeth, and many of my opinions were formed uh, during the war, uh, the Vietnam era. And, um, you know, uh, of course, that war was also very contentious. Um, but it certainly is the cornerstone and foundation of my view about good guys and bad guys uh both then and now you know and uh obviously people in in this country um are very divided on that and it's true also about palestine the palestinians are very much like uh the vietnamese they use tunnels just as the vietnamese liberation forces did uh, and they are steadfast and determined to to fight to regain their land just as the vietnamese did they're analogous. Okay, uh, Mike, go ahead. Okay, two-part question. Okay, first of all, is there any possibility that this was um, a false flag war? Has there been any uh, conspiracy theories about possibly Saudis blowing things up October 7th or the Israelis themselves causing this false flag just so they had a reason to destroy Gaza and um, uh, move, you know, cause genocide and move people out of that land. And the only reason I see this, there's not Yahoo doing all this is because of gas and oil. Because there's huge natural gas reserves off of Gaza or Palestine. And there's pipelines all over Palestine from Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran. Name your big, <laughs> your big oil countries. It's so, a very yeah, my first question is: this, there are chances of this was a false flag, just a you know manufactured, um, a manufactured October 7, 9-11. So go ahead and go at it and speak up a little. I can't hear you. Yeah, we just need you to yeah speak up a little bit, Mike. That'll help us. Is, is, is my microphone better now? Yeah, that's better. Okay. That's a very interesting question, and um, uh, it can't be ruled out. What we know, for example, is that the Israeli military knew for uh, almost two years of the uh, Hamas plan. 
that was executed on October 7th. Uh, it was fully documented. Uh, the, the report that came out in an Israeli magazine called Plus 917 um, uh, said that the Israeli intelligence service uh, felt that it was very unlikely, it was too ambitious. Uh, Hamas couldn't do it, so they ignored it and let it happen. It does dovetail. Are you okay? Can you hear me all right? I can hear you fine. Okay. It does dovetail with your mention of the gigantic gas fields and oil fields uh, right off the coast of Gaza, which are under development by Chevron in collaboration with the Israeli government. So you've got something there. And it's a very interesting thing. If it's, it also dovetails with the blatant uh, genocidal statements of uh, the Israeli cabinet basically saying uh, they're human animals and we're going to uh, drive them out um, and uh, put them under permanent siege. So uh, the suggestion that you're making, if I understand your question, is that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, after screaming bloody murder about the uh, Hamas operation on October 7th, uh, the uh, Israeli forces got what they uh, wanted, which was an opportunity to try and wipe out the uh, two million Palestinians who have That's lived in Gaza. That's what I thought, a false flag. Well, thank you. It's All a, right, uh, let me just add a footnote. Okay. It's a possibility, um, and uh, I don't want to uh, uh, sign saying, yeah, that's what it was. Okay, Ron possible. and Jim, we got you. I'm going to let Ellen go next. Yeah, so um, just to follow up on that one, uh, there is a couple of documentaries. Uh, October 7 was an inside job by John Hankey, um, who I've talked to, and it's, he also did um, that COVID-19 was an inside job, and he's got another one. But he's a great documentary, but uh, been totally uh, censored. So I guess, you know, maybe you could address this issue of censorship uh, regarding the news. I, I know you've been, you were anti-war for the Vietnam War, too. And I guess I remember last time you said that you knew... Um, Mrs. Ransom, I'm friends with the Ransom family in Bronxville, and uh, you know, um, I told his her son that uh, that I remembered you speaking. He wanted your name because maybe he'd remember you. But so, as an anti-war activist, uh, Question. what's your advice for us now? You know, um, we're up against very similar issues to the Vietnam War and uh, the censorship and misinformation of, of the media, the propaganda that I know NPR doesn't seem to um, represent the, the voice of the people uh, of Palestinians. You know, what, is there anything we could do, you know, um, to, to address misinformation or, or is it just gone so far now because of the neocons? All right. Well, it's an excellent question. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Little, uh, little just be. what was that? A little louder, please. A little louder. Yeah, that's like that. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, the, I would like to answer the young woman's question in some detail and depth. Just this week, um, uh, Israel expelled Al Jazeera. Uh, from uh, Jerusalem. Al Jazeera uh, has been essentially the only uh, source of reliable uh, news information about the slaughter in Gaza, as well as reporting across Israel and in the West Bank. Uh, but the, Israel hasn't just expelled Al Jazeera. They've killed several of their journalists. And in total, over 150 journalists have been killed in Gaza. A large percentage of them are Palestinian journalists uh, that uh, 
uh, all of them were uh, uh, wearing highly visible press credentials, et cetera. Here in the United States, we have been flooded with misinformation from all outlets, from CNN, uh, NBC, MSNBC, uh, et cetera, et cetera, as well as the official news sources, the New York Times and the Washington Post. Uh, the, we are very fortunate to live in a period of uh, alternative media. You know, it's possible to go out to, uh, uh, forgive me, I'm uh, blanking, but if you, if you go to YouTube, uh, you can get quite a lot of very reliable news. And you can also go for uh, 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 press information to sources directly in uh, in the region. And I use them all the time, and they are uh, uh, documented in this book. The, one of the main motivations for my writing and publishing this book is precisely to correct, to correct the record and document uh, the truth from reliable sources. Okay, uh, Ron, we'll get you next after Ron. Ron Batag, you're up next. Ron. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, Kim, you go after. Uh, you go. We gotta go. We're gonna go run, then we're gonna go uh, to our uh, to back to the tappers, and then Kim will get you right at two, two left. Okay, Ron, go ahead. You gotta unmute, Ron. Sorry about that. How's that? Yeah, that's fine. All right. In your opening remarks, you mentioned this uh, end of the unipolar world, and I. I only presume that, uh, or I assume you're referring to the BRICS and the Global South and the various kinds of uh, deals that have been uh, orchestrated involving something like 140 to 150 countries now. And uh, more and more with the insanity around the dollar and the speculation and the seizing of various accounts, uh, obviously the option for them is to start doing it outside the dollar. So I was wondering, um, in light of... Uh, a number of nations in this area, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, I Iran, and um, Arab Emirates, and I think the other was um, Eritrea, they joined the BRICS in January officially, and then immediately you have this operation, as people have been indicating, it might be a, a set up and a concocted operation, but to stop that emergence and um, uh, skewing any kind of continued development of the, the BRICS arrangement which the United States should actually join and be part of in terms of industrial development. And it parallels in terms of a conspiracy, uh, the Ukrainian operation, Yanukovych went to China to be part of development and again was toppled. He went in uh, November, December, and he was toppled in, uh, in, Ukraine, uh, in, in Ukraine there in, uh, in February. So I wondered if, if you are- Ron, I'm sorry I uh, accidentally muted you again. Sorry about that. That was we, my fault. We got you to, I wonder if you. Yeah, and how about now? Good. Yeah, we got you. All right, so my question is, in, in light of this um, battle, as you said, Okay. are we still all right? Yeah, we're yeah. still all right. In light of this battle, that in setting up in this end of the uh, unipolar world and uh, these kind of credits for development, uh, are these operations proxies uh, for the bigger war to back down Russia and China? As, as you mentioned, they're, they're pushing also quite insanely. And secondly, in freezing that mountain of paper, I can drop something in the chat later, how do we actually uh, ally sides in development? My question to you right now is, are you familiar with the BRICS and the role and some of the dynamics involved in that? And is, is that what you were referring to? Yes, that's exactly what I was referring to. And I, uh, cover it in some detail in uh, one of the six uh, sections or parts of the book. Uh, this is a uh, historic uh, change uh, that is in fact changing the world. Uh, you referred to um, the uh, new members of BRICS in the region. Uh, the last one you mentioned was er er Eritrea, but in fact it's Ethiopia, but oh, you're, right. Right. you're right. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's an interesting speculation whether um, this would have been another 
uh, motivator uh, for what uh, the young man at the start of the discussion called a false flag in which uh, uh, Israel uh, very possibly with uh, uh, covert support from the US uh, decided to, to uh, engage in this uh, uh, attack on Gaza for that reason. But the, the, the bigger thing and why I subtitle my book From Genocide to Global War is that in fact, it's crystal clear the United States is currently engaged in war on three fronts, in Ukraine, in, uh, in Gaza and West Asia, as well as in the Far East. The buildup in the Far East um, has not morphed into full-scale war, uh, probably because it's just too large. But uh, we've heard the, the war drums, uh, both a Marine Journal and a uh, Air Force General have both predicted war against China either next year or very soon thereafter. Uh, the uh, the buildup in the Far East is uh, enormous. Uh, like I said in the introduction, they've essentially tried to duplicate NATO for the Far East and have uh, brought Japan and South Korea, as well as the Philippines, uh, into a uh, a close alliance together with the broader alliance uh, in what they call the Quad. Uh, the uh, the reality of war is is more than mere danger. We are looking at a kind of a desperate attempt by uh, the world's hegemon to stave off what it considers the disastrous loss of. Uh, full spectrum dominance of the globe. And it's, it's, it reminds me of, of kindergarten, you know, uh, they don't play well with others and they, <laughs> they don't seem to be able to uh, figure out a way uh, to have what the Chinese call common prosperity for a shared future. Instead, they view China's rise as an existential threat. And it's also pretty clear that uh, uh, that the U.S. neocons are prepared to uh, support the Israel with anything in order to hold on to their control of the strategic Middle East region. And there is, of course, much more to say about this. But your question is right on the money. Okay, you're, you're next. Okay, uh, we don't have... We didn't have all these wars when Trump was in office. It was after Biden showed weakness in Afghanistan. He left $80 billion worth of supplies. He left planes and munitions. He left it over there and just went, left, took, took the military out. 13 were killed because of his incompetence. And we left Americans in in Afghanistan, and the good Afghans, the Afghans, we left them there. And ever since then, we've had problems in Ukraine, Israel. We're going to have problems in Taiwan. These protests on, in these campus, uh, Biden met all these Chinese to, to guide these uh, elite students. They, they guide them to, to, to protest like this. And Ch China and, 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 and Biden let these Chinese 30,000 in this year alone come in, these insurgents, and it's not only the schools, but when, uh, when, uh, when Hamas, Hamas uh, attacked the festival there on October 7th, this was all planned with, with these protests. They, 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 they had these, these leaders come in and, and guide these uh, students. But my question is, if all this problem is because of Biden is weak, Trump, is, Trump wouldn't allow all this. I, I know his Trump has flaws, but he, at least he fights this. Thank George, you for your... All right, very well done. Very well, very well done, George. Very Thank well you for your comments and question. Uh, obviously, I do not agree. Um, and I actually think that Trump, and there's essentially no difference between 
Trump and Biden uh, uh, on the war situation in all of the parts of the world that we're focused on today. Uh, it's clear, for example, uh, uh, Trump was uh, at least as aggressive as Biden on Israel. He's the one that uh, moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, which was a violation of international law. Um, and uh, uh, while he has had comments about um, uh, what you could call tactical disagreements with Biden, uh, in reality, uh, uh, foreign policy debate stops at the uh, water's edge traditionally for the uh, U.S. elite, the, the so-called uh, foreign, foreign affairs crowd based on Wall Street. And um, uh, the comment about Afghanistan is interesting. I mean, the, the, the U.S. lost in Afghanistan just as they lost in Iraq. Uh, it's true that Trump decided to uh, leave troops in Iraq, despite the fact that uh, they had agreed to leave. Same in Syria. Uh, whether Trump uh, would have uh, uh, gotten so deeply uh, in the mud in Ukraine is an open question. But in reality, I don't think there is any significant difference at all on foreign policy between Trump and Biden. Okay, Kim, sorry to keep you waiting for so long. You're up next. Go ahead and ask your question. Thanks for waiting. Okay, you're welcome. Um, first of all, Dee, I want to really congratulate you because you said something very important that most Americans don't even acknowledge, and that is the very existence of the U.S. empire. Yeah. Um, the the idea that we're just a north, another country uh, is a false one. And I say this from a rather unique perspective since I was a sergeant in the U.S. Marine Corps during Vietnam. I turned around while on active duty and fortunately never got sent over to, to Vietnam. But I've been looking at this stuff for over 40 years as well, trying to understand what I was part of and how it changed. Um, the United States has been trying to dominate the world since at least 1945. You can argue it goes back to 1898, and you can even argue since the uh, uh, first col colonists came to, the, to North America in the 1500s with the Spanish and then, of course, the English in 1607. But the, uh, but the thing that I think all of us have to wrap our heads around is the United States is an empire and the, and the, the country, our country is the heartland of that empire. And one of the things that also is going on, uh, and I've written extensively, if, if you're interested in a place I, I read a lot and, and write, uh, for is znetwork.org. Okay, Kim, um, it's question time. So if you have a question, I know you're trying to, elaborate your use but you'll be able to speak it at length during the rebuttal okay uh, i'm sorry about that That's um okay. well i was just gonna say i guess what i'll just say real quickly is i think you need to stand on that empire stuff because you get you get delusions like uh, you know the other people that don't want to deal with that such as the preceding speaker i think it's just a crucial important point and i congratulate you on that okay i'm done Thank you. Thank, Sorry thank about you, that. Mr. Kim. Appreciate it. All right, yeah. Dave, you're up. Uh, did you say I'm up or somebody else? Oh, no, you are. You're answering this question. Thank you. I would like to agree with Kim. I think that his comment is uh, dead on the money, um, uh, both in terms of the time frame and the reality. The fact that the United States has over 800 military bases outside this country around the world, most of them clustered to surround uh, China, but also to surround Russia, which they've done actually for our entire lifetimes. I mean, uh, I'm, 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 in, I'm in an age peer group here. You know, we were all born, <laughs> you know, around the mid 40s. And uh, 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 most of us know that the United States emerged as the number one uh, economic and military power 
uh, globally from that war, and it has used it to consolidate its hold, its hold on everything after the demise and collapse of the Soviet Union in uh, uh, 1990. Um, it uh, uh, moved uh, aggressively to consolidate its position. There's a lot of documentation. I don't think I need to go into it about how uh, the uh, U.S. government policy at that point was to essentially eliminate any challengers at all. And it has done so um, systematically and brutally. But uh, we can le leave the details for later. Thanks very much, Kim, for a comment I appreciate. All right, we got another one here at Tampers. Sorry about the wait there. Uh, I came in late because I uh, didn't appreciate how terrible the traffic has gotten. Uh, so I got stuck in traffic getting here. But uh, as far as the uh, Middle East uh, situation, um, I'm on record as hoping that there would be some kind of a solution in which the Palestinians and Israelis could live in peace. It seems the extremists are the problem on both sides. And um, I've often wondered um, if there could be some kind of way of um, finding out who the extremists are. I mean, I realize that uh, uh, we live in a world where sometimes suggesting things that are uh, seem unpalatable on the surface, but um, is there some way that uh, we can figure out uh, who are the people that, uh, like for example, Hamas caused this current situation because of uh, them, their hatred, they wanted to just kill some Israelis. They even killed a bunch of Israeli citizens and, um, that were at a um, music fest that, uh, as I understand it, was actually trying to promote peace as one of the subjectives. And uh, we have a situation where there used to be 20 or 30 years ago, Israeli, uh, you know, I guess I'm probably doing a rebuttal. The question would be, how could you, is it possible that there was a way to identify the groups that are so anti-peace and um, educate them somehow or be able to, uh, I don't know, maybe offer them some kind of a, Secluded area where they could be um, not a problem with uh, getting the rest of the people that are willing to accept peace uh, to be able to uh, live together. Well, it's a very important question, and I thank you for it. Um, it's an opportunity for me first to uh, distinguish between anti Zionism and anti Semitism. And th this is critical right now. Just this past week, your president went on national TV to denounce a surge of anti-Semitism across this country. He yep. was referring to the massive student protests in solidarity with Palestine, in which there has been absolutely no evidence of anti-Semitism, even though there have been provocations trying to uh, paste anti-Semitist uh, attitudes on the students, and they simply don't fit. But going back to uh, the question of how can the Israelis and the Palestinians live in peace, it's important to point out, you know, that in the attacks on the Palestine solidarity, the um, APAC and the Israel lobby has said that from the river, uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free. That that is an anti-Semitic, uh, genocidal slogan against Palestine. It's worth remembering that the slogan "From the river to the sea" was first used by the Likud party, the the precursor to Netanyahu's party. Israel is implementing a one-state solution in the land of Palestine. The first chapter in my book, after the preface and the introduction, is called Restore Historic Palestine, End Zionist Apartheid. And in that context, uh, uh, I document that uh, the, the Palestinians are very, very uh, 
ready and willing to establish a democratic secular state in Palestine open to all religions and all nationalities. It's true that there are some hardcore, deep racist uh, uh, Zionist people who would not be comfortable living in that kind of a society, just as there are uh, hardcore racists in this country that want to drive out all people of color. And it ain't going to happen. And there will be conflict endlessly until that issue is resolved. There's more that can be said about that, but that's, that's a hint of where I stand. Okay, uh, Dee, I got a question for you. Then we'll go back online to a, a second round unless nobody has up here. I'd like to know your thoughts on um, Iran. And uh, secondly, uh, where does Russia fit into all this? And uh, are there bad actors in the world besides the United States? <laughs> well, I would say, first of all, that the bad actors are pretty much all lined up together in NATO and the group of seven. They are the traditional historic colonizers of the world, and they have run roughshod over the rest of the world for uh, actually the last 250 years, roughly speaking. Their hold is slipping, and it's causing them to act extremely badly uh, against Russia, against China, and against all the peoples and countries of the global south. Um, now, as far as Russia is concerned, it's interesting. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the position of the United States, as articulated by Jeffrey Sachs, was, no, we're not going to help them. We're going to make sure that they collapse and can be uh, divided up so that it will be easier to take advantage of their enormous resources. Russia has pretty much as much oil as the rest of the world put together. It also is uh, the world's leading producer of wheat and many, many other resources. The fact that it's one country, just as the Soviet Union was one country made up of actually, I think about 20 countries in fact, but uh, the US was very happy to break up the USSR, but it's not done. It wants to break up the rest, uh, and it and it continues to believe that Russia is its traditional enemy, just as the USSR was. Um, Iran had its revolution in 1979. It was actually the second revolution. The first one came in 1953, when uh, the U.S. CIA engineered, together with the British MI6, the overthrow of their president, Mossadegh, who had the nerve to want to nationalize Iran's oil. And the U.S. and uh, you could say the uh, Aramco, the American Arab uh, oil company that was an alliance of um, uh, Standard Oil, now Exxon, and uh, British Petroleum, they would have none of it. They had, uh, as they saw it, legitimately taken over those uh, enormous oil reserves. And the idea that uh, the Iranian government and its people would be the legitimate owners and beneficiaries of it was not something that they were going to allow. When the uh, Iranian revolution uh, took over and took back the oil resources, they were the enemy, and they continue to be the enemy. Um, and uh, I believe that's all I need to say about that right now, but we'll probably come back to it. Thank you. Michael? Yeah, you're on next. Okay. We'll get to, go to online after yours. Ron's hand I has been up for a say, long time. The way I view the, the anti-Israeli that's surrounded by all these enemy states and uh, I, I view the, the persecution of the Jews the same as the persecution of the whites, especially the white males in America, all across the country. To bring in, I know it's another topic, but I, I see the similarities. And uh, um, can you tell me what you point on that? It was, it was pretty fuzzy. I, you know, I didn't get it. Could somebody translate that? All right, Dee, what he was asking was, uh, he views the uh, 
persecution of the Jews, much like the persecution of the white males in our country. And he wanted to get your views on that. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, I, I think that the persecution, the historic persecution of the Jews in Europe, culminating in uh, the Holocaust during the 30s and 40s, is in most is most comparable to me to the Israeli slaughter of the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank today. Those are the parallels I would see. Now, you know, I, I'm white, although I do have, like most people in this country, uh, mixed blood. You know, my grandma's from Mexico. So you could try and drive me out because I'm, you know, uh, 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 polluting the blood supply in this country. But the truth is that, you know, it was white invaders that took over uh, this country, basically all of the Americas um, over, you know, several centuries ago. And as I mentioned before, we're a little bit like bad kids in kindergarten. We can't seem to share well with others. Um, and it may be that it's because of paranoia or fear. Having slaughtered so many million natives in this country, there's a lot of people who are afraid that they might come back and hit us back. You know, and after, they, after uh, this country took over approximately half of Mexico, which is now called Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, and California. Uh, I think I missed one. Um, you know, the Mexicans are a little bit annoyed with that. You know, they think they didn't cross the border. The border crossed them, you know. And as far as the other people of color, you, you know, they were brought over in chains in the in the holds of ships, slave ships from Africa uh, uh, and used uh, as free labor for a, about two and a half centuries and really can be credited with having built up the wealth of the country. Now, again, uh, what we've seen, especially among the former plantation owners and their supporters in such uh, august institutions as the Ku Klux Klan is that they're kind of afraid that if if black people were to get justice, that they'd have to give up some of what they stole, you know. And I hate to tell you this, but it's going to happen, one way or another. There will be justice in this country. Okay, I Ron. I know you were once up, but go ahead, Ron. You're next. Yes, you can hear me. Okay. Yes. Well, you've you've kind of answered this as kind of a. Um, uh, point of clarification when you said that uh, you made the distinction between the United States and then you shifted to uh, Aramco oil that, that um, we're really um, and as it just came up in this discussion now there's a there's a difference between a mission and orientation and a, um, a renaissance kind of application of uh, the first nation state uh, in the um, in the world and then all the ideologies that we had in parallel with that, some of the oligarchy that followed that, or even you know, falling back into some of these um, manipulations on uh, ideology ourselves, so that we we have these kinds of uh, histories of not living up to the standards our constitution actually lays out. But this 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 question of two systems in the United States also is what people I don't think really get. One, there's an American system of credit, like Lincoln did in the Greenback policies saving the nation and laying the bases. Roosevelt goes back to that to win World War II. And then there's a whole tradition of finance and Wall Street that's really of the other oligarchical camp. And one I wanted to ask if you see that difference between an American system of credit, which is really what's going on with the BRICS and other nations now like China. And we've kind of given that up. We've gone to a speculative policy. We, we're bailing out these speculators at record rates. So we have like a trillion dollars in military budget to protect them. We have trillion dollars in debt every year. We really have to give up that system and come back to an American system of credit like Hamilton initiated, uh, Lincoln had, Roosevelt used in the war years. And we're at a point where we've got to make that decision and come back to that credit structure in the United States. So I wanted, when you said the, the empire, there is an empire and the US is part of that empire. But what I'm saying, we're a manipulate. We've been manipulated away 
from our principles, and we're now the enforcers of that old Roman, Venetian, Dutch, now British Empire. I just wanted your thoughts on that that distinction that you made in the difference between a Ramco running at the the um, cartel structure under the empire versus the United States as policy. Our policy is dominated by that empire faction. And you're right about both parties. Well, it's a very sophisticated question, which uh, uh, I can only answer in part. But uh, a key thing to bear in mind is that it appears the only real, really profitable industries in this country today are um, oil, military, and banking. You know, they've essentially hollowed out what was uh, industrial America because they found that with uh, the empire policy of globalization, they could take advantage of cheap labor everywhere else. Uh, China was a major beneficiary of this, you know, essentially uh, uh, a gigantic part of U.S. manufacturing was transferred. It wasn't stolen by the Chinese. It was taken up and lifted by the owners of the companies and their banker buddies. And it's an interesting thing that, in fact, uh, it's a possibility that the war danger with China can be offset by the fact that these industrialists and bankers have moved to China kind of like it that way. They've been making money hand over fist uh, from their investments there, as well as investments in other poor countries like Vietnam, like Indonesia, like Mexico, like all of the countries of Latin America. You know, uh, it's, it's especially, I think, people in the Midwest can feel it. They, you know, we have what we call a rust belt in the Midwest. The industrial core of this country has essentially been gutted and wiped out and moved overseas. And this was part of that empire faction, Ron, as you suggest, that in fact is totally in the saddle here. You know, um, uh, one of the economists that I uh, lean on in my book is Michael Hudson, the author of Super Imperialism who talks about the fire sector as the dominant force in American capitalism today. Fire stands for finance, insurance, and real estate. Those are the dominant sectors in the US economy today. Notice that there's no in, 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 industrial part of it. He does, however, acknowledge that the military industrial complex, as well as the oil companies, continue to make massive profits and it's interesting that in both cases they are profiting off u.s war and military occupation in other parts of the world i think for example that uh the u.s government would would not be so interested in sending billions and billions of dollars now roughly 150 billion dollars to ukraine if it weren't most of it being going to, going directly to the weapons manufacturers in this country. That's a pretty interesting fact. And the other thing about the 800 military bases around the world, they guarantee that uh, the, the US economic domination continues in most parts of the world. It's falling apart though, thanks to BRICS. And it's a long story. But in fact, these countries have realized they're being robbed as they are forced to pay for everything in dollars. Now with BRICS, they're going to be able to uh, pay in their own national currency or a common currency established by the BRICS countries. And the old way is no longer viable. I hate to tell you this. It's true that uh, FDR, uh, uh, in the face of the collapse of the uh, Wall Street system during the 30s and uh, taking a bow to the people who were fighting to have their lives back instituted a different kind of economy where we have social social security. Thank God I live on social security uh, and uh, uh, the right to have a union. We're losing that. But all of that is being, as I said, there, we've, we've lost many of the things that Roosevelt uh, brought in, and we'll lose more unless we fight back. Okay, uh, Andy, and I know Jake, your hand's up. I have a question. Uh, 
we we have 24 weeks left till the election. Uh, can you, uh, from your perspective, can you give us any ideas of what we can do to combat uh, the massive billionaire funded criminals that are getting ready to take over the election and reinstall Trump? I'm well, go willing to, uh, I'm interested to hear your views on what Americans can do to prevent uh, this country being taken over by Trump and uh, 50,000 criminal appointees that he's going to put in civil service all over this nation once he gets control. Thank, well, you. thank you for that question. It's a very tough question to answer because the reality, the grim reality, is that people in this country are being disenfranchised totally. The duopoly, as uh, um, uh, Margaret Kimberly calls it, uh, gives us uh, no choice for change. There is, I happen to think that Jill Stein may be the, the one who could do it, but her chances, even she says if she were to uh, benefit from a gigantic flood of support where the 50% who don't, haven't voted uh, in the last dozen elections, would suddenly vote, and she and uh, the, she she points out that there are three war candidates: uh, Biden, Trump, and RFK, and one anti-war candidate, Jill Stein, with the Green Party. Uh, my friends are feverishly uh, trying to get petitions signed to get the Green Party on the ballot in in New York, but uh, Jill Stein says she expects to be on the ballot in most states, and She's the only chance we have, but what it really says to me is we're going to need stronger medicine. Voting is not going to be enough to stop what's coming at us. You know, we're looking at um, uh, a wipeout one way or the other. You could call it uh, uh, hard-fisted fascism or soft-fisted fascism. It's going to be nasty, and it's going to cause, uh, it's going to require uh, organized resistance, uh, which is something that we haven't really come to grips with yet. It's like the organized resistance that people tried to mount in Germany in the early 1930s. We're going to need it. And uh, 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 no matter which one, of, if, if, if uh, either Biden or Trump wins, we're in trouble. And we're going to have to figure out how to deal with that. Okay, Jake, you're next. I'll uh, yeah. Okay. Dylan, uh, I I disagree. I disagree with your analysis there. Um, I think we'll be much more in trouble if if Trump if Trump gets in, he's going to set his own agenda and the hell with anybody else. Just look what happened on uh, January 6, twenty twenty one. If that's an indication. Jake, anyway, my question. My question. Let me get my question here. Okay, my question is. Um, how can you how can you justify um, how can you justify um, uh, what's the word? how can you justify uh, Putin's actions in Ukraine? Uh, Russia was Russia was an, uh, Russia was a uh, uh, imperial power long before the United States came into being. Where we even got Alaska? They had colonies going all up and down the west coast of the United States. It's a good Centuries question. Ago, Alaska certainly... was a, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, it's worth noting that uh, Russia has only occupied the Russian-speaking parts of uh, Ukraine. It's worth knowing historically that Kiev uh, was historically the first capital of Russia. Um, and uh, Putin's view is that uh, this is a civil war among brother countries, um, and that the the Ukrainian war effort has essentially been propped up by uh, U.S. and NATO support for a fascist takeover of yeah. the Ukrainian government that took place in January of 2014. Yeah, well, I. I, I... I'll, I'll tell I'll tell you I'll tell you something. I think he's got it backwards. NATO will be expanded because of Putin's actions. I have no I have no use for Putin at all. 
well, we don't have to argue about it. We can have differences. Uh, I, I can tell you this. It was much tougher sledding for me uh, two years ago uh, when the special military operation started uh, in February of, of 2022. Everybody in this country uh, was mobilizing uh, against the Russian invasion. Um, and uh, uh, many people had the same view that you had uh, and continue to have, but their numbers have dwindled as they have seen uh, the reality. Uh, uh, it's interesting to note that you could contrast, for example, the, uh, the war practices of the Russian military operation with those of uh, Israel, backed by the United States. They, they have, apples. Like it's comparing apples and oranges. Well, I wish that were true. Uh, I will tell you this. While, uh, uh, while there are still people, uh, mostly in Washington, but around the country too, that, uh, that think it's right for the U.S. government to pour billions and billions of dollars in weapons into uh, Ukraine until the last Ukrainian falls. But in fact, uh, more than half a million Ukrainians have died so far in this war. And uh, uh, the Ukrainians who are supported by the U.S. and NATO barely can get uh, more troops from their own people. And uh, Ukrainian young men uh, are doing anything and everything to get out of their their of, of any requirement for service because they're going to die, you know. Uh, so that French President Macron has floated the idea of bringing ground troops from Europe. Uh, it's notable that uh, the U.S. Uh, tries to make it seem that we won't be called on to send ground troops. They know that our young people will say no, they won't go. And I'd like to acknowledge my dear friend and brother, Steve Grossman. He and I uh, uh, led a movement during the Vietnam era, fighting for the right to resist unjust wars. And one of the results of that, and by the way, I acknowledge also Kim and uh, the veterans of the Vietnam War who woke up sometimes too late after they had already been tragically used and brutalized and hurt uh, in that war. But in fact, this country has learned a lesson. It's tough to send American boys to fight in these crazy wars. Um, and of course, we know that the U.S. war planners uh, uh, invest billions of dollars in demonizing their enemy of the day, whether it's Saddam Hussein, whether it's uh, uh, Vladimir Putin, whether it's Xi Jinping, they're all horrible people as far as the U.S. government is concerned. But I hate to tell you this, the quality of leadership uh, uh, it, it, uh, by comparison between the United States and these countries is starkly in favor of these countries. You know, the, the, these countries are actually, uh, the, the governments of these countries are doing things to improve the lives of these people. That's what the United States government doesn't like about them. Okay, uh, Ellen, you wanna go ahead next? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to know your, uh, if you had any ideas along the kind of hypotheses that I've been investigating, which is this, the way that, I think we need to, uh, I don't, we can't figure out how to prosecute the criminals in like our government, the CIA, the, uh, the Department of Justice, uh, you know, the, and specifically an idea that I would like to um, get people talking about because I can't find a prosecutor to prosecute it is the way that the part of the prosecutor management information system that was stolen in uh, from the Justice Department and turned into a surveillance like Palantir system for spying on things. It, it's integrated into our our um, you know the echelon, the satellites, the submarines. I mean, this total you mentioned total 
spectrum domination, total information awareness. These are, you know, crimes uh, that we haven't figured out how to how to take on through the world courts. But uh, you know, it seems that we, you know, question. Is there a way Surely. to? Um, do you have any ideas about? Because it, you know, people have been saying elections aren't going to make the difference. It's, and the other one hypothesis I see a problem is the way the states are divided between, you know, I can have an abortion in this state, but not that state. And, you know, the way they play the, the states against each other, done by APAC lobby, I realize are the ones that stole the promise software. And so it seems like if we could, if there's international criminal law to, you know, stop the control of elections and rigging of foreign policies and war decisions and war crimes. I don't know if there's how we can get international court to deal with these problems. It's a terrible question. It's probably the best question, but it's terrible because uh, it's a, a problem that cannot be solved under the current uh, governing situation. We, we know, for example, again, just last week, uh, that there was a cabal of senators who openly threatened to stage an invasion of the Hague because the International Criminal Court there uh, was uh, talking about indicting uh, Netanyahu. And uh, the, the, the smart money is that the State Department personnel or the CIA uh, delivered a silent message, a quiet message saying, don't even try it, you know, but the senators uh, were so rabid about invasion. It's worth uh, mentioning that a federal judge in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, back in December agreed to hear a case against uh, uh, Biden and Blinken and Secretary of Defense, what's his name? Um, and he agreed with the case presented uh, by uh, uh, several Palestinians and their supporters that in fact, the, the US uh, government policy of uh, support and weaponizing uh, of Israel was in fact a, a violation of the constitution as well as of international law and was in support of war crimes. Uh, but he, even after he agreed, he told them, the, the fact is that I have no jurisdiction. Uh, the US judicial system will not uh, rule on this topic. The same was true during Vietnam, uh, despite the fact that war crimes were continuously committed. Um, and uh, it's highly unlikely that uh, war criminals will be judged or punished unless something happens, unless, for example, uh, the U.S. and Israel actually lose um, and a, a new uh, uh, confluence of power reshapes the way the International Criminal uh, Court were to be set up, as well as the International Court of Justice. We know, for example, that the World Court has found uh, plausible evidence of war crimes and genocide committed by Israel. Uh, and Nicaragua has brought another case to the same court uh, uh, that Germany's military support of Israel is also a violation. But, uh, it's gonna take stronger medicine to get it to stop. We're gonna to have to see a change in the uh, confirmation of power in order to be able to uh, deal with the war crimes that are happening. I okay, think. Uh, this will be our last question. Oh, this question, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Mike, you're, you're, you'll get your last question. And yeah, then we're gonna to have to renew our connection for rebuttals. But I'll explain real, when that comes over. Oh, we, Sid, you got one after this? Yeah, no, oh. rebuttal. Okay, we'll go into rebuttals after this, but I'm going to need to shut down and re reboot my computer to get the renew the connection. So, uh, go ahead. To, to the author here. Um, so, uh, 
it's been pretty well established that yeah, this is a huge war crime. The whole Israel has lost any kind of support around the world except for stupid USA. So um, right from the beginning, while Israel was invading Palestine, <laughs> that this nut, nut Yahoo guy was saying that they're all coming for us in Israel. So what percentage, my question is, what percentage that comes out of nut, nut Yahoo's mouth is propaganda and lies. Mm -hmm. I, whenever I hear that guy opens his mouth, I have to click because in the, you know, the American media eats all that up and American media can't be trusted, only BBC can basically. Yeah. But what percentage of um, what Netanyahu says is lies and propaganda? I, I think most of it is. Okay, let him answer, Mike. I would give it about 99.9%. Uh, uh, only slightly higher percentage than um, than Biden, who parrots uh, what he says. It's, it's a phenomenal situation that we have here. Uh, it is interesting that in Netanyahu's case, even though he's in trouble politically, it's like he has to keep the war going to avoid being thrown in jail. But at the same time, a large percentage of the Zionist Israeli population has views very similar to his. Uh, in the United States, it's a little bit different. The uh, uh, Biden and, and Blinken have to keep the lies coming in order to keep people confused and divided. A much mm -hmm. larger percentage of the population here in the U.S., uh, is at least for a ceasefire, and a very significant percentage are for complete end of U.S. support for Israel, for obvious reasons, uh, and uh, for a complete change in U.S. foreign policy. But the lies keep coming, and uh, if you don't like Biden's lies, just wait till you hear uh, Trump's lies, which we've already heard most of. So we're in a, a difficult situation. All right, at this point, we're going to transition to rebuttals. Charlie, I'm going to make you a temporary host. I got to disconnect and re reconnect the computers just so we don't lose anything. Um, if you just bear with me for a minute, uh, we'll get it. You're going to be made. You're going to be, uh, we're going to make you a temporary host, Charlie. You guys conduct amongst yourselves. I'm going to disconnect real quick and then we'll uh, be renewing real fast. So, my apologies, please. Give us about five minutes, and we'll be re we'll be renewing uh, connections here. This has been an amazing discussion, I must say. I'm I'm very impressed. Uh, needless to say, I have my favorites. I'm looking at Kim and at Ron. Uh, your comments and questions have been especially uh, on the point, I think. But everybody has. Uh, you know, prove to me what I thought already, that uh, uh, it's possible to find thinking people in this country. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else, D? you'd like to say? Uh, um, well, I look forward... Sure. I look forward to the rebuttals and all the comments. Uh, I'll uh, avoid wasting people's time until I've heard what other people have to say. All right. I'll, I'll begin by thanking you for your putting. I'm looking forward to reading your book and uh, for fielding our questions very articulately. We appreciate your coming and we extend an invitation for you to come again. Um, thank you. The only thing I'd offer is a word of caution. If you're gathering information uh, and you abandon mainstream media, there is the inherent danger of bias confirmation. So a lot of people are putting out a lot of things on this. They have no credentials uh, whatsoever. Uh, the Russians are still putting out things for one purpose and one purpose only, and that's disinformation and to cause trouble. So be cautious. Simply because something is allegedly censored does not mean that it is true. It could be censored because it is erroneous information. 
Yes, I think or that's true. Or stop by a crackpot. So I guess I'm saying is let the buyer beware. Uh, but I will not accept the fact that simply because something does not appear or is embraced by the mainstream media is that it is, in fact, have some measure of accuracy. That is not the criteria that you use for determining whether something is accurate. But anybody and their brother, I've been a webmaster since the Internet began, and I can put this stuff out there like you wouldn't believe, but you have to be cautious that you may, in fact, be reading something produced by a Russian a soldier in the Russian army that came from Moscow. Thank you again. You covered a lot. And let's see if you're restored back to service. We are back online, Charlie. Uh, you can hear us now. Thanks for your little bit of interregnum there. We are now going to go to rebuttals. And who's got rebuttals here? I know Sid. Uh, anybody else got a rebuttal? We're going to Andy. Anybody out there? Ron Vitag. Um, we got. We're going to give about an hour, so we're going to give about six to seven minutes each. Let me carry this over to him. Uh, Sid, do you want to go first? Yeah. Uh, do you want? Yeah. I'll go ahead. Take the mic over to Sid. We'll let him go from there. And you got six minutes, Sid. Okay, and then go ahead. We're going to get him over to Sid. He's a little disabled, so we're going to let him go from there. All right, Sid. Well, I'm going to talk about the, the IFM, IMF, I mean, and the World Bank. Let's say a country wants to build a railroad, and they go to the uh, inter International Monetary Fund and say, wait, we want a certain amount of money in order to build this railroad. Well, they said, okay, we'll give you uh, the amount that you want. That's the principle. So they start to build the railroad. The United States starts to build it. But then they say, well, we went into different things and we needed diff different companies to come in and do what they have to do. And the different companies made the price go way up. Now, instead of two, mil two billion or Two million, it's now five billion. And so the, the country that wants to build a railroad, okay, we will pay it, but they don't have enough money. So they go to the IMF and say, we need more money. So every time they go there, the price goes up and the interest goes up. When the interest goes up, they're impossible to actually take care of it. So what happens is the United States comes in and says, we'll take over your waterworks. And they come in, take over the waterworks, lay off people, and the country even has less money and more unemployment. So they're stuck in that position. Then China has a different policy. They say, oh, we'll go to the railroad and we'll take some raw materials as a consequence. It's called the Belt and Road Initiative. It's the Belt and Road Initiative. They call it a win-win policy. So who's going to go the country that's going to ask the IMF to come in and get into debt, which you can never pay off? And then the United States takes over a lot of their industries and a lot of their uh, private industries or industries that belong to the country. So they never get out of it, and it's called imperialism. And that's the basis of the United States policy. It keeps trading well from the poor country. That's why you have revolution. That's the reason for it. The United States is a capitalist country. The capitalist country wants to do one thing. 
who wants to make more capital, who wants to make more profit. And that's the basis of the whole United States policy. War is, is the, a continuation of policy by another means. So the whole policy is to drain the world of the natural resources and its wealth. And that's the purpose of the United States, where China is interested in allowing every country to better its um, policy for the average citizen. And the United States hates that because that means the end of capitalism. Okay, who is next on the rebuttals? All right, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll we'll go, uh, okay, uh, we're gonna let Ellen go, then we'll let you go, Ron, okay? All right, Ron, you'll go. Uh, Ellen, go next, and then we'll get you. Go ahead, Ellen. Got up front. Okay. Um, yeah. I thought I. Yeah. Well, hi, I'm Ellen Corley, and I thought I would follow up. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I turned it down because the waitress asked us to turn it down. Maybe you want to turn it back up again. Because I know Sid's been allowed. Yeah, the, the you, I turned it not there, but on the on the speaker here. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, on there. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Okay, I, we don't want it too loud. So, um, yeah, I just I really liked uh, these talk. I just bought the book. I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, you know, so I agree with him uh, in, on a lot of levels. Part of what I like about this uh, group, when Don and uh, and um, Doug told me about the College of Complex, it's, it's, it's okay to agree, you know, um, free <laughs> so I'm all for it. Uh, what I want to get to is the analysis with a group like this. This is what democracy that needs is a kind of classroom, you know, where we can, or like an intelligence agency where we're analyzing things together. And uh, basically what I liked about your book and, and long time anti-war movement, uh, free speech movement in general is that we, uh, you know, there's we've, these ideas have built on themselves. I, I've been reading about the Berkeley free speech movement recently. And uh, they, it was neat to see that James Petrus was part of that because I'd read his books about, uh, about Zionism and Israelis and the, the Nazis. And you never really knew whether, you know, is this, there's so much self-censorship being worried about being anti-Semitic which is being made worse. But uh, recently I've uh, been reading, you know, it's this problem of this censorship that goes back to APAC, uh, the American Israeli Political Action Committee forming. I basically look at things like an investigator and uh, investigative research. That's my background, market research, investigative journalist method. And, um, you know, who did it? Who is at the origin of this? And, um, and we've got to test hypotheses using inferential statistics, right? Using the inferential method. They are just, they're messing with us by giving us reporting statistics like, well, there's no way to know if the vaccine is killing people because we won't know for 70 years. And we've uh, suppressed, you know, given Pfizer the right to not report its data, even though. We used the FOIA and got the data, Naomi Wolf and Steve Bannon, who I don't like, but at least they got the data, they analyzed it and um, found that, yes, uh, <laughs> that women's ut uteruses are shriveling up, you know, um, it's got now where birth rates are only, I think, 25% of men 
this man, this woman at a meeting said her son-in-law has no sperm now. They basically the best What are you talking about? Shut up, Charlie. Ability to have any sperm. Uh, Look at that rebuttal is this. Charlie, let her go. You're disrespecting. Why? It's not sense. You're you're disrespecting the meeting, Charlie. Yeah, you're not a chair. You're not chairing the meeting. No. This is a fact. Why let people reproduce? I, uh, this is a fact, you know, um, he, this son-in-law has done the statistics and it's all being censored off the internet, just like it's being censored in this meeting. I haven't been able to talk about vaccines for four years. I actually haven't been able to give any talk. Charlie says it's free speech, just write him. I've written him four times about different speeches. I don't know which one he'd allow me to give, but anything that's critical of the FBI, of the CIA, of the is of the Zionist Israeli state is um and who is making biological warfare who is making chemical warfare who is using uh you know the promised software that this is cyber warfare this is lawfare which is the use of of the state and our laws is form of warfare right this is the truth is Carl Schmidt it was Hitler's uh jurist and he the you know the, this history is replete with we know exactly how the fourth right came the third right came about and it's using the same no, 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 method I, 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 that's bringing the fourth right about now uh where that it's by way of deception it's the strategy of tension that was left in place by through nato gladio team b which was a um these are the mega group that Whitney Webb talks about in One Nation Under Blackmail. This is, these are, you know, the, they, you know, they, like, if you just read, I'm recently reading about the Bolsheviks, uh, you know, in the 30s, or that they, you know, this was mostly Jewish leadership that were doing, you know, kind of pitted against the, the Zionist Bolshevik, the book is that Hitler was a Zionist and a Bolshevik, which just seems crazy. But you realize they're they're wage a war that you know let's let's America allied with Russia and and um, you know the UK basically the it's being puppet mastered from above by by MI6, the CIA, by you know, pitting us against each other and using propaganda to to perpetuate the total wars, you know, forever wars. And uh, we have to basically be forensic historians. And um, you know that we're saying the right thing when, like, Charlie cuts me off. Who uh, yep. there? There does seem to be. A, there's a phenomenon called the cyan. The cyanim are the Mossad's, the assassination, there's Katzas in the Mossad that have infiltrated our bureaucracy at every level. And they are, um, the Katzas, a classic example I saw on the internet of a Cyanem, I'm winding it up now, is that they'll make a call and they'll say, um, call Ellen an anti-Semite, you know, call Bobby Kennedy an anti-Semite because he is pointing out actually who the criminal is which is the ultra Zionist TV, you know, Gladio Fourth Reich Empire. Thank you. Okay, Ron, you're next. Thank Seven you, Ellen. Minutes. Very interesting. Right, you'll get the la- you'll get the last uh, you'll get the last word, Dee. All right, okay. Ron, go. Yeah, what do we have? Yeah, after, after Ron. No. After we have six. Ron. Go ahead, Ron. All right, we have six minutes. Six minutes, Ron. Six, seven minutes. All right. And then we'll get, uh, we'll get, um, we'll get. Okay. If I start now, okay. Yeah, go ahead. But then we'll go right. to Don and then we'll go to first, Ken. Okay. First of all, uh, this won't come off as a rebuttal. I, I definitely thought this was um, one of the most honest, clear presentations I've heard in a long time. Uh, well thought out, bit of courage if it goes all the way back to the start of this um, Ukrainian situation. We, I've been in that fight myself. Um, I think just to elaborate on some of the things we've discussed, it's come up a couple of times tonight. Uh, okay, then how do you change it? 
you have to have if you you can't do legal operations because the whole legal system is created and controlled. You have all these kinds of problems we've allowed ourselves to be dumbed down and brought into. So if you went to the founding fathers, they'd have trouble recognizing us today. So one of the things I dropped into the chat, and I noticed that the links don't work, but I also have uh, the Schiller Institute link there and my own link if people want direct access, but it's a program called the OASIS Plan, which was put on the table back in 1974, um, where we had representatives by the uh, Iraqis, the Egyptians, some German businessmen were interested in it. This plan would actually be based on an infrastructural project that would drop canals from the Mediterranean to the Dead Sea in from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea, basically with a energy program, especially tied to nuclear, which would desalinate that water and allow literally for the massive increase of, of water agriculture, everything in the Middle East, not just for the Israeli-Palestine situation, but for the entire region, all six na nations there. Now that program was put up and put forth by an economist by the name of Lyndon LaRouche, who I've uh, organized with for the last 44 years or so. Now that project was mm -hmm. the basis, uh, at least the grounding basis that it would, allow, would have allowed it to work of the OASIS plan under Lincoln, uh, under Clinton, in which Arafat and Rabin agreed to settle. And there you have a, a good mark of an example of an individual who had the courage, as he said later, to face the fact that we have to have the courage to change our own axioms. And Rob Bean, a leader uh, of the military of Israel, decided, like in the Treaty of Westphalia in the 1600s and in the uh, religious wars, he decided that there are no victories on a military scale on this thing. And he changed. And he agreed to come to a negotiation and they agreed, people remember that meeting under Clinton's administration there, and they agreed to this piece for development. And LaRouche said at the time, don't worry about who owns what piece of land, don't get the project started, get the shovels in the ground, move this thing so people understand that they've got a part of the justice in the future. Now that particular project got sabotaged in many ways, they brought in the IMF, the World Bank, it never got moved on. And then Rabin was assassinated by right-wing um, Kuhani networks. And then also you have the situation with Arafat was taken out. So here you have, so many decades later, we still have the same situation. Now that OASIS plan is now back on the table being discussed internationally. I tried to link it in the, um, in the chat. People should get in touch directly, go to the Schiller Institute email, that one will work, you can find it. This lays the basis for not just peace in this area. One of the things we got to put on the table is a totally new security and development architecture where these kinds of projects outside the World Bank, outside the control of the IMF and these colonial structures become the basis for development. So you can look at the Lake Chad programs in Africa, all these things. This is really where the bricks are moving on. So if we move to that kind of policy in the United States, it's not something that's odd to us and out of our history. That is our history. We used to do that. So if we use our own powers as citizens and force that kind of debate, even now with a couple of months left to the election, make that the policies that nations that that our candidates have to reflect on. And we've got candidates running on that. The, the question here is we've got to look at the how well they've succeeded in dumbing us down, whether you look at the schools, whether you look at the culture. When I grew up, when I was a kid, 70% of our the population who worked had a job in industry, production, agriculture, farming, mining, you name it. And there was maybe 30% tied to services and whatever, and then the, the banks and other kind of criminal activity. But 70% was involved in production. Today, it's probably 12, if not less. And a lot of that is a superficial economy. So start wrapping it up, please. I thought I had seven minutes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Two and a half. I'm sorry. My apologies. Thank you. Go ahead. So what I mean by this dumbing down of the population and, and the failure to have even access to a way to figure it out, a good example came up in a couple of situations this evening. Netanyahu. Who is he? Well, the British in orchestrating the whole Middle East policy, Bernard Lewis planned all this. 
In the Nazi period, there was a guy named Japotinsky, directly related and wanted to work with the Nazis. Well, he had his secretary and later a, a biographer who son presently has, is Bibi Netanyahu. So you have to understand these Zionist networks that were created as um, cults to protect empire. They have nothing to do with Judaism, nothing to do with Christianity. They put the shirt on and then they run their operations for colonialism. The other aspect that came up is when Charlie says you have to be aware, you have to be aware of the Putin line coming down in any number of ways. Well, you don't have to worry about Putin putting out lines. He said it straight out again in his inaugural speech that we need a collaboration with the West. We need a Treaty of Westphalia approach where we actually function on the, the good and the benefit of the other, meaning the enemy, everybody. And he laid out point blank, if you, the United States, France, all these layers pushing the increased face off. Well, then we have you're forcing us to use a thermonuclear response if we're threatened. And he's not saying it because he's going to come after the West. He's not interested in taking Europe, never has been interested in taking, you know, um, Ukraine. It's been this protection of the genocide that was moved on against the Russians. Right, right now, the subject constantly keeps being changed in, in Gaza to everything but the, the rate at which we're gen the genocide is being run. So my point here is we've got to take a deep breath, looking exactly where we are and what time it is. And I suggest that people use a link. It's called eir.news, and you can get an update specifically to this analysis every day. And my name and number is in the in the, in the chat. If those links, if you yeah. can't find that Oasis plan, pick it up, pick up the phone, call me, send me an email, I'll get it to you. But I'm part of... The 49th meeting yesterday took place, the International Peace Coalition. It represents about uh, 800 people now over the last 49, uh, week, uh, 49 months laying out the strategic architecture for development. The OSS plan is part of that and the alliance of forces to actually step outside this collapsing empire. So definitely use that link, eir.news. You can always use me. Okay. Kim, we'll get you next. Don, you want to go up and do your rebuttal? Yeah. All right, Kim, you'll be here after Don. Okay, so, so you, you got seven minutes, Don. Go ahead. All right. Well, I don't need. Okay. But All right. Well, I'm glad to see the College of Complexes is still meeting. You know, I totally agree with what Ellen said about freedom of speech. Because it, it's freedom of speech is uh, very much uh, under attack in this country. There's this growing number of people. It, it almost sometimes it seems to me like a majority of them, you know, freedom of speech used to be one of the things that almost all Americans believe in. But lately, it seems to me like like the majority of Americans, both on the left, right, and center, don't believe in freedom of speech anymore. They believe in freedom of speech for themselves, for their own side. Freedom of speech for me to say what I want, but not freedom of speech for you. No, no, no. You don't. You don't have. In other words, and, and I'll, I would allow other people to say uh, to say what uh, what I agree with. But if you say something I don't agree with, you're out. No, you don't have a right to say that. You know, it's 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 anti-Semitism, or it's it's hate speech, or it's uh, you know, or 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 it makes me it makes me afraid, you know, you know, or it, it it's 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 insulting, you know. But there's always some kind of excuse, you know. Um, but we can't let people say that, and and I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, everybody, you know, and everybody everybody has some version of speech that they think should be forbidden. It seems like to me. You know, um, and and so uh, anyway, so I'm glad to see that the college is still operating, and 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 um, and and I and and I just you know those of you who um, uh, you know I, I hope it will be able to continue operating in the future, but uh, right now you know things do not look good for this country. Um, I, I think that. Um, uh, if if, uh, if if Trump becomes president, and it looks like right now he probably will, uh, he's going to make this country into a dictatorship. Because, and and, and, and uh, he, Trump himself has, has said he intends to be a dictator. So so that's um, which would mean that now. And in fact, I'm going to make a prediction right now about him. If he does become president, 
uh, he's going to be president for the rest of his life. Uh, he, he's not going to leave office alive. And, uh, and whether that means he dies in, in, his, in his next term, or whether that means he dies 30 years from now, I don't think it's going to make any difference. Yeah. Uh, maybe. Uh, now, fascist dictatorships have a tendency to collapse when their leader dies. Uh, if you look at, for example, the history of, of Nazi Germany or, or Mussolini, or excuse me, Italy under Mussolini, or, or even Spain under Franco. And, uh, but anyway, I did want to say also in response to the, in, in, I just wanted to respond to something the speaker said. The speaker claimed, uh, the, the speech, by the way, Putin is enthusiastically in favor of Trump becoming president uh, again, because, because, uh, because Trump would, um, um, uh, Trump would probably not support Ukraine uh, in, uh, in its war of self-defense. And, um, he would probably uh, leave the Ukrainians to their fate. So those of you, those of you who are looking forward to the Russian conquest of Ukraine, should be quite happy about that. And and I want to say that the, the, the speaker claimed that that Russia has only taken over that only taken over the parts of Ukraine that are majority Russian. Well, that might be, except that there's a you know. Uh, those those areas where there, where there are Ukrainians in those areas they've been uh, they they've been them. locked up yeah they've been put they've been disappeared you know like like uh, and the other thing I would want to say is that is that it's not going to stop there because Putin in Putin intends to take over the whole of Ukraine he has denied Ukraine's right to exist so Putin's attitude toward Ukrainian nationalism towards Ukrainian independence is uh, about the same as Benjamin Netanyahu's attitude toward Palestinian independence. All right, that's all I have to say. About okay, Kim, you're next. You got seven minutes. Oh, okay, okay. You, you, you're muted, Kim. You gotta be unmute. Kim, you gotta unmute. Yeah. Okay, there you go. go okay, ahead. thank you. Start from the beginning. Okay, um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Dee. I thought it was a very stunning analysis. I thought it was excellent. I agree with, with much of what he said. Uh, and I appreciate the logic and consistency of his argument. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Dee. And I'd like to talk to you personally uh, uh, after this. Um, the other thing I want to say, though, is it has not been talked about at all. And I would like to add that. And that is the U.S. national debt. And, you know, in this country, I mean, the country has... Uh, Every year they put up an economic plan. They say, this is what we're going to uh, spend our money on. And at the end of the year, then they come back and they look if they spent more money or less money, just like our, just like our own personal budgets, only with a whole lot more zeros behind it. All right. But then the U.S. government joins that together with previous debits and surpluses. And that create over time, it's a cum cumulative thing. And what we find is that for 192 years, uh, from George Washington's first administration to the end of Carter's, the U.S. national debt was $0.9 trillion. It was actually $909 billion, but under a $1 trillion. In the last 40-some years, since Ronald Reagan, our national debt has jumped up to over $34 billion, or trillion, trillion. dollars, I'm trillion, trillion. Um, the fact is we're so bankrupt. It's not even, it's not even silly. Um, what that does, and this is an interesting thing about whether the BRICS will be sort of the liberating force, or at least another force that, that D prescribes, I don't know. But the fact is, is that we have increased our spending and much of it being on the military while reducing taxes of the rich. And that we are at risk because if the global monetary system shifts off the dollar, we're screwed. We can no longer run a, a roughly a trillion dollar deficit a year or more. And so, in other words, basically, we're being we're we're undermining our country so that we can continue to to, to have this empire that tries to dominate the world. Now. Uh, and and I think that's got to, that's something that's just not being talked about. How in the last literally forty years, 
we've gone from from less than one trillion to over thirty four trillion dollars in debt. That means even if we all didn't get paid for a year or whatever, we still couldn't pay off our debt. And our debt is over 120% of our national production. So there's a lot of things in here that that need to be added into the mix. And that, of course, would would be a debt. Should other countries take us off the dollar um, and where we could no longer basically uh, survive by writing hot checks, it's going to cause a tremendous amount of turmoil in this country. And that's something that needs to be anchored into the analysis. Um, but the other thing is, any talk of war with Russia or China is stupid. All right. First of all, remember, I mean, because this is, we've, been, we've been brainwashed to think that these countries want to invade us, take us over and stuff like that. Let me point out that the greatest invasion uh, in history was was D Day, the invasion of of uh, of, uh, of France. Now that was across the English Channel, which is only twenty miles wide. Now you're not talking about anybody coming and crossing crossing thousands of miles of ocean with the greatest navy that's ever been created in the history of the world, and think they're going to do that and succeed. Plus, then they'd have. For 340 million crazy Americans to deal with who have more guns than 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 people. So it's really <laughs> stupid. I mean, anybody's talking about China or Russia invading us is so full of shit they their eyes are crazy. Anyway, the point <laughs> I'm trying to make is that the only way this stuff can be resolved is through nuclear war. And that's one of the things that's that's what I'm really worried about in in uh, Taiwan and the South China Sea is that you send some American aircraft carrier in there and he gets blown up. The only response is nuclear. You know, our, our record in wars in Asia is a little, little bad. It's, it's about, uh, I think we're through Oh, three and, and one, if we're being gracious to, to, to Korea, this is stupid nonsense, but we, we're being, we're being, I mean, think about this. I would argue that we're being trained and have been trained, it's not just new, to basically trust in our politicians of both parties, you know, and they're sort of telling the American people, don't think about this, don't worry your little head because uh, the politicians will take care of us. The politicians have failed us again and again and again. This means that Americans have got to start thinking for themselves and and we need to do that. But the other thing in challenging the system, I don't think anybody, I mean, Jill Stein is by far the best anti-war candidate. I agree with that. But even if she got elected, which is not going to happen, how could she get anything done through the House or the Senate? That's not going to, that's not going to work. The reality, I think, is that what we've got to do is we've got to be trying to find people who are like-minded, who we can talk to, and start organizing and creating organizations that that we take responsibility for this, that we just don't sit back and depend on somebody else. And and I appreciate Dee's talk today so much because I think that's a, a step in the right direction. And it sure beats these conspiracy theories and all this other bullshit that's getting thrown around. Uh, a, a, and, and I think, you know, Charlie said, well, we gotta, be, we gotta be clear that it could be a Russian soldier. The United States has a much greater history of spreading propaganda and lies and everything else than, than, than the Russians could ever think of doing. So it's not, I mean, I think we've got to think critically about whatever we're told, whether it's coming from folks we agree with or we disagree. We've got to think, does this make sense? Is the starting place? And and then, you know, you know, to look at it and look for the empirical evidence. We all can have different opinions, but who can back theirs up with empirical evidence? And I think that's one of the things I've, I've appreciated about Dee's talk. And I want to thank you, Dee, and I want to thank those that are thinking about this. But we've got to we've got to look critically, and and not just not just fall into the lies and the propaganda that we've been told. So thank you.
Okay, I'm going to do, uh, I won't go the full seven minutes, but I'm sure I'm going to give, what? Six. <laughs> six <laughs> minutes, I'm sorry. You're right, Andy, six minutes. All right. I'm going to quote from James real quick and explain what it means. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Or don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you have, do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you may ask with wrong motive, motives, that you may spend it on your pleasures. I think what everybody is forgetting here tonight is that we all, are sinners. We all have the evil within us. And we all have what we don't want. And we start quarrels and fights because of things of national prestige. Maybe uh, the other guy's getting us, or sometimes it's legitimate self defense. The problem, I think, that the whole world is that we're starting to forget about our Creator. We're starting to forget about who is really in charge. Did not Jesus say, love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself? God gives us the freedom to accept the rejected or accept the rejected's teachings. He will come if he's asked. He will give wisdom and abundance if you ask him. But he will leave you alone in this world if you choose not to accept him. And sometimes I'm beginning to wonder if men should not maybe heed that lesson a little bit more. Start caring about your neighbors. Esteem them as you would others. There was a bishop around a while back. His name was Martin Sheen, and he was very popular in the 50s. Fulton Sheen. Fulton Sheen, I'm sorry, you're right. And he often talked about the difference between communism and capitalism and about patriotism and about things, but all of his messages were the same. We have forgotten God, our creator. We have forgotten who really is in charge. God cares for us. We should really learn to start caring for others again. Now I know that there's a, it might be a simplistic message. I know it might be a very one that a lot of people don't want to hear, but I really think that that, my friends, is the truth of the matter. And with that, I'll conclude and say this. Believe in God, believe in his principles, and you shall be saved. Amen. Freedom has responsibility. All right, next rebutter, please. Who's next? Charlie, you got six minutes. You want to go? I'll Charlie. All right, Charlie, you want to go? Yeah, all right. I got a few things to say. Go ahead. Um, once again, thank. I want to thank our speaker. I won't be very long, but for almost 10 years, the so Russians have been putting out pure propaganda with one purpose and one purpose to only, and that's to disrupt elections in Europe and the United States and to dissuade cause disrupt the political dialogue in these nations. They've done it in every single country in Europe. I was amazed to ascertain that they even were publishing disinformation for a little country like Montenegro. They all day long, every day, you have to ask yourself when you turn on your internet Am I reading something written by a Russian? Now, I let these like to come along and say, what is their first rules? One, they didn't like the college, they have rules. One, don't listen to mainstream media. And two, don't listen to any political person in the United States, right? Don't listen to either one of those. So who are they left listening to? some sergeant in the Russian army putting out who knows what. 
Now, we listen to Don Ritchie say something about all speech should be free. There's such a category as no right is exercised in the absolute. The speech that they're putting out is intended for one purpose and one purpose only, to cause harm and to advance their position in the Middle East. If you think that's permissible, you just heard a religious thing, what is the intent of your action? Is there is there action to engage in worldwide diplomacy to achieve peace or to advance their own presence in this part of the world? If you think that's acceptable motivation, reason for speaking out, uh, so be it. Anyhow, that's all I got to say. Enjoy. Good evening. Very good evening. Thank you. Okay, who's next? My uh Andy, do you want to go? Yeah. Okay, Andy, you got six minutes. Go ahead, sir. Huh. Andy, Andy took your spot, but you'll go right after Andy. Go ahead, sit down and you'll go after Andy. Okay. Why don't you stay up front, Mike? All right, I got my props. All right. Okay. Go ahead, Andy. Okay, uh, some things that I agree with Charlie 100% on uh, don't trust the mainstream media. Uh, we're bathed in a fire hose of propaganda 24 7. Uh, what? Since I've been coming here in 2007, I've been bringing people summaries of databases, like 10 or 15 books on a subject, hundreds or thousands of man years of research done by different researchers from different areas. It's not like an opinion from Fox News or one guy. It's like, as I said, it's like picture Albert Einstein and 2,500 of his physics friends saying, hey, the earth isn't flat. We got pictures from the space shuttle. Well, on many different subjects, there's groups like Albert and his friends. They produced a database of forensic evidence over time that's unassailable. One of those databases says that smoking four packs a day is not good for your health. I think if you try to debate that today, you look like a loon. Equally, uh, I haven't seen a good debate between anybody from the Flat Earth Society and anybody from NASA. Although there are 618 people in the Flat Earth Society, is the latest count. We've got, as Michael Douglas said in the movie American President, we have serious problems and we need serious people to look at them. I coach seventh graders in science. We teach seventh graders at that level. In order to solve any problem, you have to first admit you have a problem, then correctly identify the problem, and then correctly identify the solution. It's a simple three steps. But many people today refuse to even recognize that we have a problem on certain issues. A lot of people, what's, there's a database emerging that the, the American military, the American military was heavily involved in helping coordinate the 190 countries locked down during the COVID pandemic. They used that illness as a way to lock down the world and transfer trillions of dollars into the bank accounts of people that are obscenely rich. This book called Canary in a COVID World has uh, like 34 contributors to it. They, they produced a database of evidence on what's happening. This is not in the mainstream media. A knowledge is in books. If you, and Charlie is absolutely right. You have to find out what's credible and what isn't. Second book, this one is called The Indoctrinated Brain. And it tells how your brain chemistry begins to change as you become uh, wealthier and wealthier and then beyond filthy rich. He said, when uh, to quote the first in the first introduction, it says, in a capitalist system, if they're if a company is making 10% profits, 
that's enough to keep everybody employed and uh, well fed and everything. When you get to 30% profit, people are doing better. The owners are doing better. When you get 50% profit, then things begin to pick up and the owners start looking for ways to begin to cut corners a little bit. Uh, try to see what they can get away with. You get above 100% profit and then you see uh, rampant uh, cheating or cooking the books and all kinds of things. And he said, finally, when you get up to 300% profit, if a company's making 300% on their and military contractors are making way over 300% as the pharmaceutical industry is, at that level of profit, there's no pile of dead bodies big enough that will be any kind of a hindrance or break on the economic activity they're doing. Killing people becomes just good business. So you, they, the pharmaceutical industry are famous for saying, we're sorry your child's dying because you can't afford $20,000 a month. We have nothing against little Johnny, but it's just business. We need our billions. That's where we are today. We've got billionaire predator psychopaths that have more money than God. They've got five times more money now than they did before the pandemic and the, the, the military global lockdown. And those predators are running a stable now of highly paid uh, college educated intellectual prostitutes that have virtually no ethics, morals, and conscience. The overwhelming majority of them are criminals that have been put into positions in the Republican Party masquerading as our elected officials. We've got a Supreme Court that you can brag about. It's the finest, finest, smoothest running, well-financed intellectual legal whorehouse on the planet. <laughs> it's a whorehouse, six to three. And if we don't face this reality in 24 months, our country is gone. The first thing Trump is going to do is eliminate the EPA. No regulations on all pollutants or anything like that. Number two on their list of things to do is eliminate all funding for uh, green uh, climate change. Give me another 10 seconds. Sure. Eliminate any funding for uh, solar, wind power, anything that will give us a clean environment and, and combat. The last thing, there's an article that said, Smirking Chimp and Common Dreams, those two websites will give you daily updates on what's going on. And I find both of them, the writers are highly credible. 77% of the climate scientists in the world now said, we're going to blow past that 1.5 uh, degree heating that we thought we could keep it under. They're looking at two to three degrees centigrade. Um, and that means uh, sea level coming up 50 or 60 feet in this century all coastal cities gone. If, if Trump gets elected, that's pretty much over for the planet. And that's where we are. Not only our country will just go down the tube, but the rest of the world, as they uh, just put the pedal to the metal, they want to reopen the Arctic National Wildlife. They want to give all new drilling leases, uh, just drill all over the Gulf of Mexico. Remember the deep water horizon? Well, you see one ocean, you see them all. Who, who cares about the pollution? This is the billionaire mindset, the predator mindset that they don't care that they're killing the planet and killing the future of the kids that are here today. They're making billions, billions and billions and billions that they can't spend. So we have to face those realities and talk about it every week. Every any, I invite anybody that has any information on this, bring it here and we'll exchange information during the rebuttal period. We got 24 weeks, people. Thank you. Okay, Mike, you're next. Anybody else want to rebut after Mike? Otherwise, I'll let the D Knight give his final remarks. Go ahead, Mike. All right. Well, it's good that we um, had this speaker. Where's he located? D, where are you located at? Bronx, New York. Bronx. Did you hear that? Anyway. Uh, yeah, we did. So it's good that, yeah, we, we need the free free speech forums everywhere. I was doing some searches on the fake internet, in the real internet, <laughs> and I only found two. There's one at University of Chicago, Ernie. Well, let's start going to that one. Okay, you're my in. <laughs> I got to hang out with you. Yeah. 
And there's one in Cleveland that's been around for a hundred years. So I'm like, well, there's a fit for free speech in America. Now that we have uh, college, there should be more college every complexes. Yeah, well, especially now that the internet and media is so controlled and so full of lies, uh, you, need, you need free speech somehow. And um, in this country, yeah, that's the number one amendment. You don't put something number one unless it's the most important. <laughs> right, so free speech, freedom of religion, get out of here with number two. <laughs> freedom of religion. Freedom of association. <clears throat> all that stuff that we're all, all associated with. Anyway, um, so anyway, I was doing some other searching. According to the UN, Let's, let's see how much fake news you guys have been listening to the last two decades. According to the UN, how many Palestinians have been murdered in the last 12 years, 13 years, by Israel? No, before October. So, so well, there was Lebanese, 100,000. Yeah, Lebanese, 100. You're close. So anyway, there's been 5,590 Palestinians murdered by Israel if, since 2008 to 2020. How many? Well, 20,000 the last month. Since well, no, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about. Before October. Yeah, why, why are there all this hatred? Yeah. So anyway, so. There's been 5,590 uh, Palestinians murdered by Israeli, probably, probably well, army. And then uh, take a guess how many um, Israelis have been killed by, you know, Palestinians throwing rocks <laughs> and then bottle rockets or whatever they say. 40, 40. 25, 30. How do you know that? How do you know that? 251. Very good. Yeah, right. So that's a ratio. If my that's probably about a twenty to one ratio. So that tells me that Israel is terrorists also and also murderers. They are. But of course, we have American media, which you cannot trust, which includes smartphones. And did you hear that, Mr. Burns? Yeah, yeah, he knows it. So it's about a 21, 20 to one ratio of murders in the favor of Israel. If you you know. You're counting. Anyway, so I'm glad we point. I'm glad we pointed out the propaganda that comes through America, comes through Netanyahu, through Genocide Joe, through um, our politicians, our horrible media in this country. The only thing I see there's a girl named Katrina in the BBC on television, BBC America, BBC America, and she has tough questions. And she's tough on all these Israeli guys, and they get pissed off. So, um, so well, I don't know. BBC's got some stack, some gut balls. So anyway, you know, what much better than American media? So um, yeah, the whole world thinks that Israel is war criminals, except for America. Yeah, I'm glad we brought up the false flag issue that. Somebody did this October 7th, and I think it's not Yahoo and, and, and somebody else. So I, I'm pretty sure they did that. To, uh, Israel's been invading and trying to take over land, land grabs. And, so, you know, they've been doing it a long time. Um, and yeah, it's probably all about money. That's silly. Okay. Ah, get out of here, man. What's, what's his mic doing on? He's, he's just, he just... So yeah, this is about money, oil, and natural gas wars again. Chevron. Okay. This time is the big okay. supporter. We got one more speaker after Mike. And Mike didn't do it, do it talk stuff. The stage. No, it just we. Charlie, what were you bitching get about? Get out. Yeah, get out. You get out. You don't want to hear the truth. There's no inside job. Okay. There's not an inside job. False flag job. nonsense. It's real fun to must with the time. Thank you. All right, what's, what's go ahead. This is a false flag, FF. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Uh, <laughs> 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 
Right, Andy? Andy All right. Go, go ahead. Well, um, there have been a lot of uh, extraneous uh, comments here tonight. Uh, I'll just uh, say that I thought it was a false flag myself, uh, that it was caused by Netanyahu. <laughs> Clearly, he ignored the report from his own intelligence agency, and it was a woman who made the report that uh, he was leaving uh, Israel open to a sneak attack from Hamas, and he let it happen. I mean, there were people after 9-11 that were you know, really adamant that George W. Bush let it happen. I don't know if that's yeah. true or not, but it seems clear that he did let it happen, whether Putin was behind it or not, I don't know. Uh, it's a little bit much. I don't want to spend my seven minutes entirely on this. I did come late. Um, there have been a lot of false things said to, not today, but um, I'm very tired because I was up almost all night. Uh, I'm bringing up a totally different topic, but one that has been discussed here at the college. Uh, a lot of you might remember um, our fellow collegian, Bill Meyer, um, who came here and I think he gave a couple of talks involved with something called the CMEs. Now, that's uh, short for coronal mass ejections. And these are electronic particles that come from the sun. They come fairly quickly, they take about two or three days to get here. That still is pretty quick, and they can cause a lot of damage. And last night we had several of them. They were kind of the middle level. At one point I got a text that indicated there was one that was a very extreme level. It's funny, when they come at the middle level on the scale of severity, they call it severe. And they call it extreme when it's up in the upper level. Now, this one that's coming towards the earth might dissipate. It might not be as bad. It didn't come last night. I was afraid myself. I kind of panicked because they didn't specify about this X level, X for extreme. Uh, and it was bad enough that we got hit by the high middle level ones last night. They were saying they were the worst for 20 years. CNN said that. I'm not the only one. Scientists said that. And um, we had a very bad attack of these CMEs from the sun. Again, that's nature. That's, nobody should have a political opinion about that. Uh, but we should be aware because Joe Meyer um, told us about these things and how dangerous they were. I think he gave two talks here. He gave another talk for a group of us uh, scientific people uh, down uh, in Hyde Park uh, near the University of Chicago grounds. Um, but um, they are extremely dangerous and they can cause an outage in the power grid. Um, they can cause satellites to be knocked out. What was worrisome to some scientists last night that maybe they might interfere with the GPS system or it might interfere with your satellite transmission for your TV or whatnot or other things that might be important. Uh, airplanes that use them for use GPS or ships might go off course very easily. And there might be a, several disasters just based on the GPS system going out. Uh, that beside the point, the really big danger is the power grid, and it could interfere with all electronic devices, any of your modern cars uh, that use electronics, your laptops, your cell phones, yeah, probably your watch too, maybe if it's an Apple watch, a sophisticated watch. If I were to wear a watch, I'd probably wear an old, old time one, I could make sure it would work in a CME attack. So there is an X coming. Uh, it may or may not glance off the Earth because they weren't predicting it would hit the Earth. I still have to look and see if the uh, spaceweather.com site, the one with Joe, which Joe Meyer recommended, to see if they have any update on that X. Alex yeah, well, Alex Jones knows, probably knows nothing about this because it's science. science so, you know, he, oh, is he really? Yeah. Surprise, surprise, like Gomez Powell would say. Um, at any rate, 
uh, just be aware of this uh, at some point because we're at the high uh, part of the cycle. There's an 11 year cycle. Sometimes it's 10 or 12. Uh, it's not completely definite, but we are at a high point in the cycle of sunspots. The sunspot that unleashed the CMEs last night was a resembling, and they showed a picture of it. I hope it wasn't just photoshopped, but you know, oh, someday we won't believe in any science, I guess. But it looked very much like the one that created the Carrington event, which some of you might know happened in 1859. You might wonder, well, electricity, what? Oh, they did have telegraphs. And guess what? When that CME, which probably is about the X9 level, the one that's coming towards us is the X5 level. But that one that hit uh, caused the telegraph wires to burst into flame and for people that were on the telegraph to have their hands burned and for a telegraph station to be set on fire. So just be aware of that. Look it up, look it up on the internet on real sites and be aware of that uh, in honor of our late um, colleague, uh, Joe Meyer. All right, Ernie, you've got about three minutes, you said. And then Dee, we're gonna go right to you after that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I missed the presentation tonight. It sounded like it was very, very good. I apologize for not being here. It was Eurovision finals uh, uh, earlier this evening in case anybody's interested. Uh, they're spectacular as usual. Um, Switzerland won, Croatia was second. Uh, what I want to comment on, uh, the talk was on war, and of course there's a war in Gaza and Israel. I want to comment on the issue of the uh, hostages. We constantly hear about, oh, we got to get the hostages out. That's the most important thing. Everybody's concerned about the hostages. Uh, I should not claim to be able to feel the pain of the people who have loved ones that are hostages here or in any other situation. I've never had that. I don't, I, you know, I don't claim to, to, to fully understand. But what I'd like to hear from one of the family, even just one person that's a family member of the hostages, is something like this. We 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 know our loved one is suffering. Uncle, uh, father, brother, sister, mother, whatever. We know they're suffering, uh, and we want them back. We we love them very much, and we want them back. But if we look at the deeper side of this, our our loved one and the other hundred or so loved ones are really a very small part of what's at issue in this war. What's at issue in this war is is two civilizations that are fighting very hard against each other. Uh, and, and they are existential crises. Uh, for the Israelis in the long run, uh, they're, they're probably gonna win this one, but in the long run, they're fighting for their existence. And the Palestinians are probably gonna be to lose and they're gonna be put into the status of Native Americans here in, uh, in this uh, hemisphere, if they do that well. And uh, so these, these issues are so much more important than the lives of a few hundred people and therefore, while I want my loved one back and we want them safe, uh, really that's not the most important thing in the war. Uh, that's what I like to hear one of those people say. And another comment on the, on the hostages, uh, that's the only weapon that the Palestinians have right now. They don't have any other significant weapon. And so I don't think that they're gonna give up the hostages easily at any point. Thank you. Okay, D, your final comments. You got about maybe, uh... Five or six minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, this was a rich discussion. Um, I would like to focus uh, basically on possible solutions. I would also like to um, make it possible to be in touch with anyone who wants to be in touch. The easiest way is through my book's website, realpathtopeace.com. There is a um, uh, contact uh, box there. You can everything comes to me, so you can send me anything. You can also use that site to get a discount on my book um, just by clicking the uh, yellow star in the top right corner of the site. Um, it's worth knowing that uh, 
the ebook um, sells for two ninety nine. Um, this is Mike. And also that an audio book is coming. There will be people especially people who drive, as well as people who have difficulty reading, that would like to have an audio book, it should be out by the end of the month. And it'll be on my site, uh, and there'll be directions on how to get it. Dean, now, could you repeat that? Just your, the link. The, the, the site is realpathtopeace.com. And... Uh, uh, it's got a lot of stuff on it, uh, including a way to get the book and how to communicate with me. You got to go to the bottom of the site to send send information or uh, questions to me. About solutions, the real path to peace is millions of people saying, we won't tolerate this anymore. Uh, and I, I share uh, Kim Skypes' comments about that, that... Uh, it's not going to happen very likely through voting since the uh, power system has the electoral system locked up. But building uh, uh, local and national organizations to say no, just as the students have been doing by the tens of thousands, that's the path. And it's, it's a global path. Millions of people across the world have already mobilized and they've already had an impact on Biden and and the war planners. He wouldn't have uh, uh, declared a pause to the sending of, of weapons and money uh, to Israel uh, without that pressure. It's still not enough. That that uh, the Israeli government said just yesterday that they're not going to allow that to stop them. It's going to take much more. Um, it's very easy to say that Israel's sure to win and Palestine is sure to lose. I'm not sure of that at all. I think that uh, uh, for both sides, it's an existential struggle. The difference is that only the United States is standing really with Israel. It's true that they have some support from their NATO allies, but they're going to lose. It's going to take time. But uh, just as in Vietnam, the, the People's War finally won. And my prediction is that that will happen here, but we can save lives by mobilizing. And I believe that's critical that we do so, that there be some kind of a united front for peace and against fascism, and that there should be a massive popular front of people everywhere saying, we wanna help, we wanna stop the war, we want to defend freedom of speech, as the College of Complex is doing. We want to provide legal support for people who are arrested for daring to protest. All of those things are necessary. We need to take uh, the advice and leadership of the Veterans for Peace and the other anti-war veterans who have uh, stepped up because of their own experience to say no. These are the things that matter. It is true that finding the truth is hard. I can tell you in my book, everything is documented. The end notes of the book take up more than 50 pages uh, because everything had to be documented. I wanted to make sure that the text itself was totally accessible, readable, and uh, understandable. Uh, and of course, I look forward to any uh, arguments and questions. I think that we need to get this word out everywhere. And I thank you very, very much for your uh, attention and your comments. I look forward to being with you again. That's it for now. All right. one, one quick thing I, I forgot to get on the screen. Yes, it's up, it's up there. Uh, you guys on Zoom, this, this is the map of, this will just take care of My, my, my. Of the oil let's pipeline and, and gas pipeline going from the Middle East through Mike. And here's a map of Russia going, or the pipeline going through Ukraine. So, yeah, these are wars about propaganda and about oil and gas. All Thank right. You, Mike. Right, Thank Mike. you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. At this point now, we're going to dismiss the College of Complexes. Thank you all for attending tonight.
Dee, I appreciate you coming. And uh, with that, we're going to stop the recording.